um, please give an overview on the state of the stream winner. Stream winner. The word is sota, sotapana, no? sotapana. Sota means stream, and apana means attained. So it means one who has attained the stream. The word sotapana generally, as used in the in the suttas, refers to one specific thing. In the commentaries, there is actually another type of sotapana, and it it, uh, it the, the commentary like uh, addition helps us to understand the the sutta uh, definition as well because it helps us understand the way that word is used in different contexts. In the suttas, it's only used in one way. It's used to refer to the person who has had a realization of the four noble truths, has come to um, realize nibbana for the first time. They have come to. They have entered into a kind of a cessation, which we call um, palasamapati, where they have realized the that all things cease, because they've seen the cessation of all phenomena without remainder. They've come to regard all phenomena that arise as impermanent, unsatisfying, and uncontrollable, and. That realization is only a, a a temporary realization. They may still later on cling to things, but because they've had that realization, at the moment of that realization, the mind goes out, the mind ceases, and there is this this uh, experience of cessation. It can last for a brief moment, it can last for a minute, it can last for an hour. It can be cultivated to last, cultivated in, in some sense of determine, determining to enter into it, for up to seven days, according to the texts. I had one student who claimed to be able to enter into it for 24 hours. And that's what she said, believe it or not. Um, but she certainly did seem to enter into it quite frequently. We'd be in the car, and uh, we, when, once we were in one of these these uh, red, red trucks that they have in Chiang Mai, and we're... Uh, we're sitting there, and she's you know, rocking in the bumps, and she's like hitting her head off the the side of <laughs> the truck and not feeling it and not not being you know being jolted at all and as soon as the truck stopped, she opened her eyes, something like that, or else it was I can't remember what it was it was like uh, we were all trying to get out of the car the truck, and she's still sitting there. There was another time where we'd be we were sitting and chanting. And uh, we'd, we'd do chanting in the evening and we finished chanting, we all got up and she was still sitting there. Because in the, in the middle of chanting we do sitting meditation. After sitting meditation she didn't stop, she didn't do the rest of the chanting, we all got up. And I sat there from my room looking through the hallway at her sitting in the hall for a while and after about five minutes she got up. She opened her eyes, got up and walked away. Uh, so this this is what this this experience for the first time where the meditator enters into cessation and is able to see the difference between what one once thought was happiness and th this uh, cessation of suffering and realizes that all things that ar that arise are unsatisfying are are, are not happiness are, are not beneficial are one, one loses one's interest in them loses the attachment to them. The first realization of Nibbana doesn't free one from attachment to things. One will become less attached to things through this realization because one now has something to compare it to. Before, the only thing one could think of as happy were arisen experiences. So maybe ice cream is happiness, or chocolate is happiness, or sex is happiness, or, or drugs are happiness, or heaven is happiness, or so on. This is what one thought was happiness, so one chases after them and finds no satisfaction because everything is changing and everything is impermanent and finds that all one is gaining through this is more and more greed, more and more attachment, more and more addiction. And when one realizes, when one realizes Nibbana for the first time, one has realized something that is, is totally free from any attachment, has no building up of craving, has no stress, no uh, agitation of mind. It's it's pure peace. 
the next moment when one arises from it, this first experience, is the happiest moment of the person's life, it will, it, of, of one's career in samsara, really. Because before that, one had no, never, in all of the rounds of samsara, never come in contact with the Buddha's teaching, never uh, come, gotten to this point where one practiced intensively this teaching and had never before experienced um, the state where, where, where all things disappear, where there's no seeing, no hearing, no smelling, no tasting, no feeling, and no thinking. So regardless of how, you know, from, from people who hadn't realized it, this would sound more devo no, uh, terrifying or horrible or, or you know, undes totally undesirable, the cessation of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and thinking, because it's, it's devoid, void of all of those things which one thought would be a cause of happiness. When the Sotapanna uh, arises from the attainment of Sotapanna, of, of Sotapati Magga, Sotapati Pala, uh, they they have changed this opinion about the, uh, about reality. This is, um, and they have changed the idea that that anything might be permanent or anything might be lasting. They lose three things as a result of this. As a result of seeing or changing their idea of what is happiness and realizing the true peace and true happiness, which leaves them with a clear and pure mind. Uh, a person who has entered into it can be in a state of bliss for days. Uh, you know, just on cloud nine for for uh, a great period of time because of the change in their existence. I, you know, talking to some people who seem to have gotten this experience, of course, we're in no position to judge, who their whole character changes and they're just in in complete bliss and contentment for a great number of days until the defilements that are left start coming back and start... Uh, um, no, affecting their mind again, but at the moment of at that moment of coming back, they are free of three things. They may still have defilements, and the defilements will slowly come back. But they know they they know something now. They know something new that is uh, irreversible. You can think of it like you have this dam, no? And as long as the dam is is fully intact. Uh, it, it, you, you know that it could last for for a great period of time, but as soon as you see the first crack in the dam, you know this dam can never be fixed, and and eventually the dam is going to break and the water is going to be released. In the same way, the sotapanna has entered into some kind of has entered into the stream. No, this is what the meaning of the word sota is. Sota means they've changed something about themselves, and they they have entered into a non-static state. This state is is not something that is going to stay still. They're 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 headed upstream, you might say, or they're headed in the direction of nibbana. It's kind of like the dam has cracked, and it's only a matter of time before it it bursts loose. So they lose three things: they lose wrong view, uh, wrong view of self, sakaya ditti. They lose any idea that there is a permanent soul because. The, this is this is the profound thing about the cessation of all experience. You realize that all that exists is experience. Without experience, there's nothing. There there is nibbana. No? There is the cessation, uh, which we call nibbana. And and so as a result, they they th this idea of a self has no has no place. Has no uh, meaning for them anymore. They lose the attachment to rites and rituals or practice that is useless. Um, they lose the idea that practice that is unbeneficial or, or of, of no benefit in leading towards the freedom from suffering, thinking that is a, it is a benefit. They now know what is the right path. So they're able to see that what is useless is useless. They can see that doing rites and rituals and performing ceremonies, that it's not the way to Nibbana. It doesn't mean that they they will stop and refuse to perform these things, but when they perform them, they'll know that this is you know meaningless or it's only meaningful because of the state of mind of the person. They come to see that it's the state of the mind and one's intention and one's clarity of mind that's most important. So when they do chanting, they'll try to use it as a, as an opportunity to reflect uh, on the wholesome qualities of the Buddha or so on, or. Uh, as they progress, they'll they'll use the chanting as a time to be aware of their lips moving or or of of the the feelings in the body and so on. 
they won't have the idea that chanting in and of itself has some power that's going to lead them to enlightenment or freedom from suffering and so on. They don't have the idea that keeping this rule or that rule is important. They don't have the idea that, for example, um, not touching money, for example, is necessary to become enlightened. So they don't hold on to the precepts as tightly. If they break a precept, they're not worried or feeling guilty about it. They just you know, reprimand themselves and say that no, that was wrong and they they make an effort to not do it again and they confess it but they don't feel upset about it they don't think that oh no now i'm going to go to hell because it's it's a concept it's a convention uh, and so they don't cling to to rules as well or, or morality uh no they they cling they, they understand it in terms of the mind state so they understand that killing is always wrong or stealing is always wrong but they understand that certain things are only concepts not eating after 12 12 o'clock if they eat in the afternoon as a monk for example they won't feel guilty but they'll maybe say to themselves you've got to be more mindful or so on and they will make a note and try to to correct their behavior that's it the third thing is they lose doubt so they lose doubt about the buddha doubt about the buddha's teaching and doubt about what makes a person a enlightened uh, disciple of the buddha so they understand what it, what are the meaning of these three things and they understand um, that what the Buddha taught is the truth because they've realized it for themselves. Uh, so, so that's what that's what the the suttas call being a sotapanna. Just one more thing, because what the the Buddha Gosa mentions this other kind of stream enter is called a chula sotapan sotapanna. Jula Sotapanna is someone who realizes the second stage of knowledge. Altogether there are 16 stages of knowledge. When a person realizes the second stage of knowledge, it means they have an understanding of karma. How this works is in the beginning they see the body and the mind functioning. They're able to see the stomach rising and that's a, 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 a phenomenon of body. And they see the mind that goes out to the stomach and is aware of the stomach rising. So only when there is the stomach rising and the mind aware of it, is there the experience of the stomach rising? If the mind is somewhere else or not thinking about the stomach, there's also no experience. One sees that there's the body and the mind. That's the first stage of knowledge. The second stage of knowledge, and this is not intellectual, is one begins to see how the body and the mind work together. So one wants to stand up and then there's the standing. One wants to sit down and then there's the sitting. There arises pain in the body and as a result there arises disliking. Uh, there arises pleasure in the body and as a result there there arises liking. Because of the disliking and because of the, the liking there arises uh, clinging and there arises partiality and there arises becoming and acting and, and stress and, and as a result suffering. And so as a result they start to see the truth of karma. A person who gets to this stage of knowledge has an understanding, non-intellectual understanding of karma. They understand how defilements really inevitably lead to stress and suffering and so as a result they have entered what we call the little stream which means whereas a sotapanna uh, another thing about the sotapanna is they're not liable to be born in in states of of woe or states of of suffering they're not liable to be born in hell they're not liable to be born as an animal they're not liable to be born as a ghost uh, they can only be born as a human or, or an angel or a god and eventually some of them will in one in one lifetime become enlightened some of them in two or three or four or five or six but the the longest it will take them to become fully enlightened and free from samsara is said to be seven lifetimes so that's what the texts say a jula sotapanna doesn't have this reassurance obviously they haven't realized nibbana but the reassurance that they have is that on realizing the second stage of knowledge in this lifetime at the end of this lifetime, with the with the breakup of the body, for this one lifetime, they will not be reborn in any of the states of suffering. The state, they will not be reborn in hell, they will not be reborn as an animal, they will not be reborn as a ghost. Uh, that, so, so they are also said to be a sotapanna for that reason. But it's a chula sotapanna and it's just a designation to mean that this is the stage that one needs to reach to be safe for this lifetime next lifetime they'll be born as a human or in a good state they might still forget all of that and and begin to practice unwholesome deeds and be born in hell as a result um, without any difficulty as for 
uh, the follow-up question. Um, many people who lived in the Buddha's time said to be a stream winners, for sh for sure. Many many people. There were um, Visaka became a Sotapanna when she was seven years old. Anattapindika became a Sotapanna. King Bimbisara became a Sotapanna. Um, they say in the commentaries there's many mentions of Sotapanna how the Buddha would give a talk and the whole crowd would become a Sotapanna or so on. They say in Sawati, where the Buddha spent a lot of his a lot of his lifetime, something like twenty six or twenty four. Twenty four years. Um that there were f seven koti of people, no? And five koti were were Arya Pugala means Sotapana or or, or or Sakitagami or Anagami or Arahant. And one koti were Kalyana Putujana, which means they were people who practiced morality and practiced meditation but hadn't become enlightened yet. And then there were one last koti who were Putujana, which means they were full of defilements and had no interest in the Buddha's teaching. So there's a story of this pig butcher, Tunda, who lived very close to Jetavana near or in Savati. And every day the monks would go past and they thought it was remarkable that this guy lived so close so close to Jetavana and he never came to um, listen to the Dhamma once or do any good deeds of uh, giving charity or keeping morality or so on. He just killed pigs for his whole life and it was horrible how he killed pigs. I think we did a video about that already, uh, but just an example. So I hope that's a fairly comprehensive explanation of Sotapan. Is there anything else that I, I missed? I can't think of anything that should be added. No? I mean, you know, there there's always more that can be said. Lots of theory involved. Um, but a Sotapanna is, is a person who has um, followed the meditation practice to its consummation. At that point they're safe. They have reached uh, a state of safety. Uh, and this is because because of the it's now become a habit and it, it begins to snowball and so it's not that they become content or they can become content. They can't become content. They have developed this state of energy, this state of, of confidence in the practice that will lead them to always think about practicing, even though they might fall into liking or disliking and even get married and have children. Wisaka had 20 children or something, uh, and she was a Sotapanna. But they will always be thinking about meditation, always be trying to find the time to meditate, always be thinking about how they can develop themselves and always be interested in good things and spiritual things uh, because it's it's stuck in their minds that there's a crack and that crack can't be fixed it will eventually overflow and make them free <laughs>